Hi everybody, uh, my name's Katrina Gowans. Um, I hope everybody is enjoying the Centre for Legal Innovation and the Alma um, Innovation and Legal Tech Week. I was just reflecting, I went to a terrific session this morning on the legal ecosystem. Um, we are rounding out day two with, we hope, what will be a really pragmatic discussion titled Case Study, How to Develop a Digital Strategy, Hint, It's More Than an IT Stack and a Chunk of Data. There's a few jargons thrown in there for good measure. Um, it's no coincidence that this is part of the advanced stream of the conference because this stuff is hard. And I think even the speakers on the panel, certainly myself included, uh, would say we don't know everything. We haven't got the perfect playbook. I've got my pen and paper here ready to um, take some tips from my co-panelist. And the reason for that is no two digital strategies are the same. They change and evolve over time. Uh, and when we say digital strategy, do we do we even know what we mean? How clear are we about, about that? Because it's more than just a single tech solution, although you will hear us refer to some examples that myself and the panelists have worked through in terms of tech solutions with the companies that we work for as examples today. But a digital, a digital strategy, I think, is more akin to something like a technology roadmap or a plan for the way in which your team is going to to use and embrace technology in the short term and in the long term. And I think it encompasses using both internal um, enterprise technology solutions and applications, thinking about maybe more tailored legal solutions that are out in the market, or even the interface between the two, possibly even building your own. And it also encompasses how the lawyers receive and give advice, how they collaborate with one another, how they record what they do and document what they do. So what we hope to share with you today is a very sort of practical approach to developing a strategy that encompasses all of those aspects of the world of digital for a legal team including giving some guidance on the principles to set you on the right path, um, how to ask the right questions to the right people, and also to learn from our successes and probably some of our failures as well. So to introduce the panel, um, I'm not going to try and do the impossible and introduce my amazing panelists. I'm going to ask them to introduce themselves. And as they do, I've also asked them to just spend a minute uh, letting us know why they think having a digital strategy is important. So Denise, can we start with you? And then we'll go to Matthew, thanks. Thanks Katrina. Good afternoon, everyone. Really excited to be here and to be participating with Matthew and Katrina to, to share our thoughts on a digital strategy. Um, I am the Legal Enablement Lead at Telstra, working with the Legal and Corporate Affairs team. I've been in that role for three years. I will uh, I publicly admit I'm not a lawyer, um, and all of my background, 20 years now, has been in uh, business transformation, mainly in financial, uh, financial services, but I have thoroughly enjoyed the challenges working with the legal team has brought into my life over the last three years. Um, and to answer any strategy is, is an element of change, and when you implement new technology, it creates a high level of change. And that level of change is both in behavior and it's both in mindset. And having a digital strategy enables the users or the clients to go on the journey with you and your, um, and your organization and to be part of the discussion and know what to expect. And then this creates a much more more opportunities for success as you go to as you start to implement your digital strategy. Cool. Um, thanks. So I'm Matthew Vaughan. I'm the IT manager at Tomkins Wake. We're based in Hamilton in New Zealand. Um, and I've been in the legal industry for an even shorter amount of time than Denise um, and come from a background in, in corporate IT. So um, it's been a really, the, it's, it's really interesting kind of bringing that experience, the, the wider IT side um, to, to this conversation. Um, and, and I've learned a huge amount as well about um, what change management, what, um, 
what IGV strategy looks like in the legal industry as well. So, I mean, for, for, for us having a digital strategy is important. It's, it's almost like a filter. There's so many possibilities out there. Um, your strategy can help you focus and give you direction in terms of where to um, spend your IT resources. Um, it can help justify and explain why you make the decisions that you do. Um, so it's, it's a framework and it's really important to guide um, the IT and you know the wider digital strategy, I think, rather than, than just the information technology side and, and the firm. So yeah, it's a, it's a document that I don't refer to as often as I should, but whenever I do, I come away feeling kind of a bit reinvigorated and refreshed. Fantastic. Thank you, Matt. And we should say it's getting close to Matt's dinner time. So if he gets looks a bit peckish, we have to forgive him at 5.30 in New Zealand. So thank you. Um, my name's Katrina Gowans. I work at Origin Energy. I'm the National Legal Operations Lead. I am a lawyer. I hold a practicing certificate. I think this is one of the first panels I've been on where I'm the only lawyer. I'm in the minority, but I'll survive. Um, what I do at Origin is I help the legal team and to an extent the company secretary team manage change. That change comes at us in a, a variety of different reasons. A lot of big sort of enterprise programs that I sit across, but more um, pointedly for today's um, session, I help manage a lot of um, technology changes for the team. So where we're either um, part of an enterprise wide um, technology change and how we fit into like, for example, a new finance system for the company or our own legal matter management and document management system, which I helped um, implement and embed a couple of years ago. For me, I think my answers are probably, we've obviously spoken too much before the meeting because my, <laughs> my response to the question is a little bit similar to Denise and Matt in that I think having a digital strategy is important because as a team, as a company, and for me in my role as a legal ops lead, uh, it prov provides guidance from a sort of a principles and a purpose approach. And I think people's time, the companies and money is very limited, especially when it comes to digital and technology. People are very, very quick to bring out the red pen when there's any technology spend. And so having some principles and a purpose to test where you spend your time, where you spend your money is incredibly powerful and something that uh, we all need to sort of have the discipline of doing. Great. Well, with those introductions, what we thought we'd like to do to get all of our audience um, on board, people that are watching live, is we've got a quick poll. Uh, we've got our little fairies in the background, and I hope they're going to launch a poll for us on screen. Just give it a minute to pop up. Here we go. The first question we'd love to know from you, does your team have a digital strategy or a technology roadmap? We'll give you about 20 seconds. Pretty easy. Yes, no, or you don't know. All right, and there's the result. So more, more than half of you don't have a digital strategy or a tech roadmap. So we hope you've come to the right place today. We'll give you some ideas about how to get started. The second question, we've got a second question for the poll. Has your team purchased or looked at purchasing some sort of technology solution in the past 12 months? Yes, no, or not sure? Well, overwhelmingly, yes, people are buying technology. But if you sort of compare that to having the digital roadmap, what that's telling me is that while lots of us are out there investing in technology, lots of us don't have that broader strategic framework in place to sort of guide those who there is a risk that you could kind of be doing lots of little piecemeal technology projects without actually thinking what is the overall strategy that we're, we're aiming, driving towards. All right, now the third question that we've got for our poll. If you've been involved in developing a digital strategy or implementing a tech solution, what has been your biggest challenge? Is it deciding what to do? Is it working out who the right tech provider is at the right price? Is it getting your lawyers or your team through the change or all of the above? All right, and the poll results. Well, there's a bit of a mix, but lots of people 
are concerned about getting people through the change, which I think is quite common in terms of that human centered approach that we talk about. But most people on the call, it's all of the above, which I'm absolutely thrilled with because we have designed our session today to cover all of those three topics. It was a little bit of a leading question. Um, Today, Denise is going to spend some time talking us through how do you work out what, what you want? How do you identify your priorities? How do you think about the data that you need to gather in order to progress a digital strategy? Matt is then going to take us through how do you work out the technology that you use? How do you work out a technology provider? How do you think about pricing in that space and budgeting? And then finally, I'm going to take you through how you manage your people through that change. And what we thought we'd also do to sort of make the, the progression through that thinking um, a bit more applicable, maybe to something that you do every day, is use a very, very basic um, mini case study, something that's close to everybody's hearts, um, how you approach a decision whether or not to buy a smartphone, and if so, which one. So consider this your domestic or your personal digital strategy. We're going to give you lots of questions to think about uh, to hopefully walk away then and think about how do you sort of broaden that to apply to something much more complicated, which is your legal team's digital strategy. The questions we're going to ask if we're thinking about this example, do I really want a smartphone or need one? Is it a priority? What are the pros and cons of buying a new smartphone? Who should I speak to to find out what's the best one, how I'm going to use it, what my options are, how much is it going to cost? Are there ongoing costs that I don't know about? How am I going to pay for it? And then how am I going to use it and maximise the features that are available? So with that, I'm going to ask Denise to kick us off with the first part of um, the session today. So thanks very much. Um, I'm, I'm thrilled to be talking about a digital strategy um, and creating a digital strategy because uh, over the last 12 months, we actually just went through that exercise in Telstra. So I hope that I can share a lot of the learnings and the challenges that, that we encountered as we did that. I'm gonna go through six steps that I think are key to a digital strategy, not necessarily in um, the level of importance, but I think from when I was putting this together, uh, I think these six, six steps are, are things that need to be considered as you start to de design your or kick off your digital strategy. So the first step I think is creating alignment. And what I mean by creating alignment is to understand the internal landscape of the organization that you're in. Um, what systems do they currently have? What's based huge user or do they like to have everything on-prem? Um, what sort of tech budgets do you have? and the ease of implementing. So speaking to your users, getting to an understanding of where the biggest pain points are, what the technologies that they're currently using and how um, they're finding it. So are they um, embracing and using those technologies on a daily basis or are they kind of just sitting in the background? You wanna understand that. You wanna understand how your customers work. So what sort of technologies are they using? How or what sort of digital applications, I should say, are they using? Being in Telstra, we do have uh, a number of applications that have been built in-house, which, which help us do our day-to-day -day jobs. So we need to also understand when we're thinking about what we do in the legal space is what's happening in the broader Telstra in environment. Um, and IT is very important to, to bring on board because you wanna understand how they work, what their priorities are, and make sure that when you, the digital strategy that you pull together aligns to what they're doing. And then um, you also wanna have a good view of what is possible and what's not possible. So as I said, mentioned cloud-based earlier, in some organizations, in banking industries for financial services, it's harder to get cloud-based environments set up, not impossible but um, it can be challenging at times. So it's good to know those things up front. Um, and you, if, if I leave you with one thought on, on creating the importance of creating alignment with your digital strategy, it needs to align with your business strategy. So for you to be successful or for the strategy to be successful that you want to implement within the team, you wanna make sure that you're aligning to your business strategy. And Katrina, I think you have a really good example of creating alignment that you would love, to, I'd love for you to share. 
Thanks, Denise. Yeah, so um, picking up that sort of corporate alignment origin, energy has five corporate values. Um, work as one team, be the customer champion, care about our impact, be accountable and find a better way. And some of them may resonate with people on the call, might have similar values. When the Origin Legal Team set about um, a transformation program a couple of years ago, where we were introducing our legal matter management system and a document management system to really revolutionise almost the way that we worked, um, I undertook an exercise with the, the lawyers sitting in the room on a whiteboard where I put up the five value, origin values and I put up what the vision was for our team if we adopted those new technology systems and we mapped the values between the corporate values and the values that we wanted to get out of our um, the systems that we were adopting and the new way that we were working. And I um, found that incredibly powerful because what it did was it brought me immediate buy-in from uh, both the people in the room, but also I had the confidence that the program that I was leading was aligned with Origin's broader values and strategy. And so it sort of gave me a touchstone to keep calling back to as we progressed through the program. Um, so the next step that I think is really important or which those of you that know me or have worked with me or um, had exposure to anything is gather data. So data is key to creating your digital strategy. It's knowing what data is telling you, capture as much as possible. Um, remember that information is everywhere, capture it all. And as you start to embark on your creating your digital strategy or your tech roadmap, don't get caught up in um, how much information you're capturing because you never know if you're going to capture something that you could definitely use down the track. You might not think in the beginning of the, of the design of the strategy that it's important, but it could become important in the end. So my advice there is information is everywhere, capture it all. Um, and if possible, display it visually. One of the things that we found that worked as we were starting to create um, our tech roadmap or a digital strategy last year was, even though it was difficult to do really large vision boards in an office that people could walk past every day, it was important for us to share visually as we progressed through that um, strategy, designing that strategy to share visually what was going on and how we were doing it. And um, that I think had a huge impact on people's understanding, people's um, ability to share data that they had or they knew about. So we were able to uncover a lot more, find a lot more information. And then others built on that as well. So they had conversations or they shared those presentations with people that they worked with. And then they, we were able to get even more information. So some of the examples were we captured some uh, HR data that we didn't think initially was going to be quite very useful, but in the end it was because it helped us to create our metrics or to, to help us define our metrics. Um, and I think it's important to, to understand too that data is the cornerstone for clear decision making. The more data you have, the more information that you can analyze, the better your decision making becomes. Um, it can help you decide if you need to focus on the basics, before you decide on innovation. So some organizations might need to focus on creating basics. So if I think about our Telstra example, the lawyers worked a lot in Outlook and in uh, Word and SharePoint and um, folders on OneDrive, but there wasn't an, un an underlying system that they were able to use to help them on the, in their day-to-day -day life. So we needed to look at some basic stuff uh, when we were defining our um, strategy but then we also wanted to make sure that if our if this digital strategy was going to take us three to five years in the future we wanted to make sure that we had the ability to to be innovative once we nailed those basics um, data can also help you define the metrics both internally and externally uh, internally of course is you know you want financial metrics you want to one of the big um, questions that a lot of legal teams want to answer at the moment is they want to be able to share or to show their business. Uh, In-house teams want to be able to share with their business colleagues the value that they add, not just the ability for them to, to help them with contracts or to help them with, with um, doing business, but uh, also to, to uh, sorry, 
uh, and minimizing risk, but they also want to be able to show their contribution to driving the business and the business's um, strategies and, and goals. Um, and you also want to know externally, what's my competition doing? You know, there's um, opportunities to understand what other in-house teams or even external firms are, are doing. What technologies are they using? What pain points are they solving? Um, and then data can also help you determine what KPIs each department uh, determine what KPIs each department has around their digital capability. So understanding where your different teams are on on their digital capability will help you to create your plan. And as Katrina will talk about, it'll help you with the change management. Data helps you tell the story. It helps you to get the buy-in. It helps you to get the funding. And it also helps you to get the support. When you're looking at a digital strategy and as you start to implement those changes or you start to embark on implementing the technologies, um, buy-in and support and funding are critical to, to your success. So understand your requirement. Data also helps you understand your requirements and what do we need technology to do. Um, so that's data, gather data. And then I think the third step is to analyze the market. Once you have an idea of what you're solving for, next, look at what's available. There's a lot of opportunities out there. Do the, do the products meet your needs? Are there uh, legal service providers that can do what you're looking to improve faster and cheaper as an alternative? Um, do your research. It will give you the answers about the market and insights on, on what's, um, what's available, who the leaders are, and those that are emerging. Um, I said uh, I suggest speaking to your peers and your colleagues. So it's been a great experience speaking to Katrina and Matt this week as we prepared for this session today and understand what they're doing and how they're doing it. Um, attend webinars like this is another good example to find out what's out there, what people are doing and how they're doing it. So analyze the market, I, say, I would say, is another critical step that you would want to take in creating your digital strategy. Um, the next step is to define your priorities. With any strategy, having defined the priorities is critical because it will help you to work out where you need to focus. It'll help you define your requirements. It'll help you define your deal breakers. Um, and defining priorities can also help to understand what you don't want or what is a must as opposed to a nice, ha nice to have. If I think back when we were designing our digital strategy, we um, looked at 21 processes and we, um, 21 of our core processes. And what we wanted to do with those 21 core processes was to determine the maturity of those processes. So how technically enabled were, that, were those processes and how critical were those processes to what we did? Um, and we did an exercise where I sent out an Excel spreadsheet, which the lawyers loved, not. Um, and I asked them to rate the maturity level of all of those 21 processes. And I did have to do quite a bit of, um, uh, what would I say, encouraging people to, to participate because we wanted to understand the different levels. So because when you look at how the executive level um, looks at their processes, it's different to how a legal counsel person would look at the processes as well as how a practice manager might look at the processes. So we wanted to get a view of all of those um, different views and we wanted to understand all of the core core improve um, sorry the, the core priorities. Um, that exercise also helped us to, to define what our priorities were, which then informed our strategy. So we were able to put together out of that maturity assessment, we were able to see what were the most important processes to us and how mature they were from a tech enabled view and then to start to think okay well um out of these priorities what we know that we need to to focus on is our allocation and prioritization so whilst we had just 
embarked on putting in a, a matter management system, which allowed us to have an automated solution for intake and then um, to manage the matter um, and to store documents. We weren't as well versed on allocation and resource capacity. So those were that was one of the priorities that we put in place to make sure that um, we were focusing on what needed to be focused on, what was the most important to the team. And the most important thing to the team, especially coming out of 2020, where people worked in a remote way, um, that they worked on the most strategic and high value priorities. And then we could focus on removing the, the low value work. Um, I might just get Matt to share a good story on defining priorities. Yeah, thanks, Denise. Um, mine's almost at the opposite end of the scale to your experience, and perhaps that's reflective of the, the size of our organisations. But um, I've really found that informal conversations across different levels of the business really helpful for um, understanding what um, what the, the, the things that the firm needs at, at different levels and, and by different people. Um, I was really surprised, and this probably came a little bit later down our IT strategy journey where we'd circulated, you know, especially around the partnership, some um, ideas and, and our sort of plan for the next couple of years. But at a um, sort of, a, it was a, a social event um, out of hours, but really interesting, um, the, the number of people who came up and talked to me and said, oh, you know, I'm really looking forward to this. I, I can really see the value there. Um, and from different, getting an understanding of those different reasons really helped me um, in a more informal way understand those priorities um, and the, the need for different things within the firm. So it's, and I've, I've always found like with IT, it's, it's very easy for it to become a, an us and them type environment but the closer you can be with a business uh, going along to team meetings and that kind of thing and just listening to to the problems people have often people don't even think of them as IT problems um, and you won't even look at them but you think well actually this product that we've got you know roadmap for 18 months on that could solve that problem now you know and so the the more opportunities you get to listen um, and, and be involved in a day-to-day, in, a -day, in those day-to-day -day conversations, as well as more informal settings, um, can be really helpful. But that also could be because I just don't really like spreadsheets either. So, thanks, Matt. That's a great example uh, of um, defining priorities, and I, and I can't stress enough and agree with you enough that getting IT involved and and then also sharing with or, or that getting the business to see that it might not necessarily be a tech. Um, a tech problem, but a business problem. So thank you for sharing that example. Um, the fifth step that I'll share or I'll talk about is design the experience. Um, you have your data, you've got your priorities, you've got alignment with the business, you understand the market. Now you need to create the experience. This is one of the, one of the more important steps um, to creating your digital strategy, but also when you're implementing your strategy. This is a, a, a really good step to help you do that. Um, you need to create the experience on how will the team be working in the next three to five years as we deliver our strategy. If you think about a strategy is generally has a lifespan of three to five years, you want to be looking at that three to five year mark um, and what will, it, what will change. From a Telstra experience, um, this phase was about moving lawyers into a new system that also allowed them to work with apps as they had done in the past. So I'm talking about when we implemented our matter management system, um, when I came on board, the lawyers were very much about uh, interacting with their business via email or via word. Once you design it, um, you need to share it. And then that helps take people on the journey and they have a, they can start to visualize how their life is going to change or how their work life is going to change. And then the sixth step is determine goals. And this step is really important as you want to show once you've implemented your strategy or even along the way, 
what the benefits you're going to get. You want to agree the goals and the KP agreeing the goals and KPIs also supports your business case. Those who agree to the funding will want to see how successful you are going to be. An example for Telstra was one of our goals was to have centrally located documents that could be easily accessed. Um, people spent hours looking for documents before we went into the new system. Uh, and by having this goal, we created then the metrics that we were going to measure. Um, and we, we, but we worked on the assumption that if we say, were to save one hour per lawyer per week, it would create uh, over $500,000 in productivity. Uh, we actually did save more than one hour a week, which uh, our business case uh, owner was very happy about, but um, it's always good to have metrics. Determine your goals will also help you to understand whether or not you're going off course as you um, implement your strategy. So where I might go to next is those are the six steps. I hope that has been helpful for you all. Um, going back to our example of a smartphone, um, some of the uh, things that you want to consider as you create your strategy to purchase your, your smartphone is you want to understand what functions do I want the phone to have? So what are the must haves that I have to have in a phone? Um, which make and model then best fits my needs and then which make and model best fits my budget. Um, you want to analyze the market. You want to understand which organization can give you the best price and the best plan. And then you also want to think about, you know, what are the goals I want to achieve with, with, with my new smartphone? What are the things I want to be able to do with it? So, um, I think we have a slide just to summarize um, everything and thank you very much. Terrific, Denise. That's That was a great um, introduction to the session and really um, I can't um, underpin how fundamental all of the, the sort of the points that you covered off are to just getting the foundations right for a digital strategy, um, as well as sort of the, the data, the plain, displaying data visually. I also love the piece about, um, you know, building up your network and knowing who to talk to both, um, I guess, in the market, but also um, internally as per sort of Matt's example. So. Um, terrific. Um, now we're going to switch over to Matt, who's going to talk us through, um, you know, how to work with technology, both solutions and people. We're very lucky, you know, Matt is a technologist, I'm going to call you. Um, so he brings with him, uh, you know, it's not like this isn't the lawyer's beef about dealing with um, technology providers, it's actually the reverse. Um, Matt's going to impart um, some of his sort of uh, experiences along the way and um, you know his insights into digital strategy from this perspective. Just to um, let people know I've seen some of the questions coming through on the chat so I'm making a note of them and we'll come to them at the end so we're not forgetting about you. All right over to you Matt, thanks. Cool, thank you. So yeah I mean you've you've got the, the sort of the start of your strategy and I guess the next step is what what do you do with it? How do you go ahead selecting your document management system or your timekeeping or your estimate estimate platform or something as as straightforward as should we move to gmail or you know what what email do we use so there's there's a whole whole range of things that that sit in there but i think i want to start by looking at sort of sticking to what you've decided already you know so focusing on not getting distracted essentially you've decided already you've made your plan and now and now's the time to stick to it so a technique that we found really helpful for this is you've got your strategy and as Denise said it's sort of a three to five year document but it, it's always good to revisit and and re mildly refresh it at least annually as well um, and keeping it front of mind is always going to be important. It's it's such an easy thing, and I'm sure we've all seen it, where a, a new document or a new strategy gets workshopped up and it, and it becomes really good and then sort of maybe gets put on the wall or um, linked to somewhere and then it kind of just slowly disappears from, from front of mind and then someone gets a, a calendar reminder three years later that it needs refreshing. But 
Um, we've kind of used our, our strategy to then inform an annual plan with clearly defined goals that relate back to the strategy. So that means you're always focusing on that annual plan. That's got, um, can be broken down even more, but because it always refers back to your IT strategy, which then in itself refers back to your company strategic objectives and values, it will help you stay focused in that area. So we, we break that down into three key areas. So we, every bit of work we do in the IT team is essentially in, in one of these three boxes. So it's to maintain, which is to make sure we have a great IT environment for the firm, that things keep working, that they're not breaking, um, and that you know everyone has the systems and tools they need when they need them. Um, we, we optimize to make sure we're getting the best out of our investments. Um, would have been interesting to ask how many people had a Microsoft Office 365 subscription. Um, <laughs> all right, that's 100% of respondents to that poll. But, um, you know, there's, there's so much available in that suite. And I, you know, it's, it's actually essentially a full time job keeping up with the changes there, you know, but there's so much out there. And, and trying to understand how and the right tools that can be used there is, is really really key and any other products that you use, getting the most out of them. Um, and that can either take the, the perspective of looking into the features like with Office or perhaps there's a great system, but the training never really got off the ground and by running some new training, you can help help your team get more out of it as well. So there's a whole, whole lot that can sit in there. And then the last sort of bucket that we put things in is to innovate making sure that we're looking forward and staying at the front of the pack. Um, we're aware of new changes. We don't get caught unawares by, by trends and technology, whether it's a sort of global thing like a move to the cloud or whether it's specifically legal like um, legal AI and, and that kind of thing. So by kind of focusing on those three areas that relate back to our strategy, we can make sure we're spending the right amount of time in each area. If you, if you don't do that, it's very easy to get focused on maintaining things, keeping things going, um, and, and not really make the best out of what you've got, let alone looking forward. But at the same time, it's very easy to get excited about all the new stuff that you that's coming out. And meanwhile, you know, the, the server room's on fire behind you and you haven't even noticed. So working for the year with our work, with um, each, each thing divided into these sections, referring back to the strategy, it, it really does give us, give us balance and create constant alignment back to that, that strategic document. So you've got, um, you've say, you've got a new system that's going to improve, save an hour a week per lawyer. You know, I mean, I love, I love that Denise was was able to sort of realize something that gave more than that. You know, that's that's really impressive. But um, how do you assess those solutions, um, and how do you, what questions do you ask, and and who should be doing it? It's, it's really important to have a sort of simple list of criteria to screen solutions on. And ideally in your strategy, you'll have some documents that, that guide those questions. For us, one of our strategic objectives is um, to move as many of our systems as possible into the cloud. That gives us resilience and flexibility um, where we need it. And so one of the first questions we asked is, do we have to install it on one of our servers? Because if we do, it's gonna, you know, that's gonna actually get in the way of some of our other strategic objectives. Um, there's, is it the right scale? You know, is, is, a, is a really important thing. There's some amazing solutions out there that would work really well for firms, you know, with tens of thousands of people. But if you're looking for something for a team of five or six, it's not gonna be great. Or the other way around, you know, if you've, if you've got a really large team, but, you don't, um, and there's this great solution that might only be designed with a handful of people in mind. So it's sometimes can be quite challenging actually to understand and get an idea of, of, of who the, the this target market is designed for. But sometimes that's a question that's worth just asking outright. Um, and, and cost obviously is something to, to sort of be thinking about upfront as well, um, at least with a, with a general idea. But 
integration is is another thing if you've got a document management system for example that you need it to integrate and that's that's something that's worth evaluating right up front before it gets kind of people start getting too enthusiastic about a specific product one, once you've sort of selected a couple of products that meet those criteria there's nothing better than getting it in front of the people who will be using it um, and and doing that in an environment that's as true to life as possible if, if not your own i'm a huge believer in, in pilot groups and pilot programs for, for these solutions sometimes it's, it's not practical but often often you can get it out there um, and uh, working from home is a big one here you know there, there could be some great solutions out there but if they can't be used by someone working from home then you know it's 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 not going to be a goer for, for anybody really and and if you can standardize and and collect that feedback i guess this is a a little bit of a repetition of denise's point on data but at a slightly more detailed level the, the more information you can gather um the better i've um i've seen some really interesting things like you can have a, a really good sales pitch you know that have loads of great slides and, and funny videos but show you maybe one screenshot of the actual product um, or you can have a demo where you're actually seeing the the product in action you know some perhaps on a computer in front of you but that's sort of you, it's really important to actually understand what the product can do and and, and how you're looking at it from there um, it's, it's surprising sometimes how reluctant people are to get get the actual product in front of you. So that's always um, that's why I'm so kind of keen on getting things in front of people because um, it's easy to to actually lose the the product sometimes in the sales pitch. So there's in terms of then um, so maybe you've selected a product and you need someone to. Um, take you through the process of, of setting it up, or perhaps you're looking for someone who can guide you at a slightly high level, look after your IT in general. There's, there's a huge number of um, software providers out there, of service providers um, who, who all do, do great things in their areas. Um, but collaboration and talking to people is, is so important. Um, there's some great groups on LinkedIn and, and local meetups for um, getting ideas about vendors and, and who people have had good experiences with and that kind of thing. Um, but it's always important to remember when you're talking to people, there's a lot of factors outside of the product or the vendor that can um, color those decisions. So sometimes someone's environment um, might mean the product wasn't suitable and it left them with a really bad view of the vendor or perhaps they chose a product that wasn't good asked someone to help them install it and you know the blame fell on the um the service provider rather than the product so it's, it's really important to to have those conversations in detail and you know if someone says a product's terrible it's always worth trying to find out a little bit more about why why that is and likewise for a vendor um, it's been really interesting um, for myself being quite new in the industry. Um, there are a couple of conferences I went to earlier on that gave me some really good insight into, into what was out there um, and, you know, gave me some ideas about things that might be worth implementing um, here at Tompkins Wake. But it's, it's a very, um, very large industry. I heard some statistics that it's grown tenfold in the last 10 years, the number of legal um, software providers and or legal technology companies rather. So it is, it is a real challenge to, to discover um, and, and work out who you want to partner with and who you're gonna go forward with. But um, I think the key takeaway there is the more points of information you can get, the better. Cool. So Denise, I think you had an example about how you selected um, or worked with a vendor. Um, yeah, um, one of the things that I found quite interesting about or an experience that, that I had with, when we were looking for a vendor was I spent like nine months out talking to everybody that I could, could find about matter management. And one of the things I learned was matter management was not defined the same by everybody. Yeah. 
Uh, that was one lesson that I learned. And then the second lesson that I learned is once we started to do the demos, I think we went out to 12 initially, or maybe nine, and then we narrowed the field down. But um, it was interesting once we selected that technology vendor, um, the number of vendors that got in touch with me afterwards was amazing. You know, why weren't we a part of it? How come we didn't get a look in? And, and I'm like, because I didn't know about you. Um, so it's so I guess the point is, you know, it's important to to understand and and to 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 really research your what you're looking for, as you said, and 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 understand what you want, and then to to make sure that you don't miss people because there were quite a few people that weren't very happy with us because they missed out. <laughs> It's, it's amazing, eh? Awesome, thanks for that. Yeah, and, and that is, um, that is, I think, uh, there's a, a continuum from what Zinni said, once you've made these decisions and you've got, you know, you've, you've made it, you've done the research and, and it aligns with your strategy, you, you know, you, you can be happy with it even if you, something comes along later because there's always, always going to be something that, look, that, that might come up there. Cool. And in terms of, you know, you're evaluating these things and, and how you can um, consider the, the ongoing sort of nature, what the relationship is once you've selected something, uh, a product, once you've um, got it up and running, you know, how are you going to pay for it? What's the maintenance going to look like? And, and that kind of thing. So, and this is where I think having a, an IT strategy that creates a clear roadmap but is flexible in its implementation is, is really important. You shouldn't have too many surprises in terms of your, your long-term goals, but you do need to be able to adjust to, to what's out there and what happens. And um, software as a service, so um, SaaS platforms, lend themselves well to being able to scale up and down and that kind of thing, um, as opposed to having a, a massive upfront um, capital investment and in, in hardware and data center space, you know, it can it can go that far. But if it's a uh, sort of a, a really key thing and it aligns with your strategy, it might be better to pay upfront. There's obviously a huge range of things there. Um, a, a key thing to watch out for in this space is um, commitments um, and, and that kind of thing. Um, some things will advertise themselves as, you know, it's, it's Fifteen dollars per user per month, and you think, great, you know, that's and I can you can add users, and then you start winding back your use, and you find, well, actually, no, every new user we've added was actually for a three-year commitment, and you know, um, that kind of thing. So there's always pays to just really think about how you how you plan to use the software, what time frames, and and that kind of thing. Um, Katrina, you had a example around sort of getting budget and, yeah, and that kind of thing. I did, um, and probably specific, maybe more to the in-house context, but um, in-house, the legal team has very little, if any, technology budget often. Um, you know, a lot of the, the, the spending sits with the operational parts of the business. What I found recently, um, where I've been trying to get a contract automation software um, underway, because I think it's going to be incredibly valuable, not just to the legal team, but other areas of the business, was I didn't have budget for a whole solution, but I got $5,000 for a proof of concept and I gave them one of our very simple documents, put in a bit of my time and got a demo from a provider. Um, and then what I did was I sort of shopped that demo around with our procurement team, with the risk team, with the legal team, with a few other teams. And it really planted the seed of something that there was potential to do. And subsequently, their procurement team took it on as a broad RFP for the, um, you know, at an enterprise level and are now sort of running mm. with it. So it's been a terrific outcome for Origin just from that very sort of small step that I was able to take from a budgeting perspective to kind of shift, I guess, to, to, to whet the appetites a little bit. Mm. Yeah, that's that's fantastic. And, I, I, and so in some ways that that system actually became part of your long-term kind of or a strategic goal for yeah, absolutely from was on our year. roadmap yeah absolutely. yeah yeah but awesome. i couldn't do it alone i think no, a lot of people yeah. sympathize um in-house that the you know technology roadmap is driven externally like by the rest of the company a lot so yeah. that's a prime example yeah that, that's really interesting maybe it's it's a perspective i um 
haven't really seen, but it's interesting to think about how an in-house team can can sort of become part of that IT strategy, you know, and, and do that. That's cool. Great. So to, to look back to our example of a smartphone then, um, we've decided that we need a phone that aligns with our strategy and and that kind of thing. And we've decided sort of roughly how much we can spend and and actually for us paying on a pay monthly plan, being able to pay it off over three years, that ticks all the boxes. So that's great. Um, now, I did see an ad on TV for a really cool phone and it had 14 cameras, could see in the dark and the battery lasts for a week. But actually my requirements are that it makes phone calls and I can read my email on it. So I need to just remind myself of, of why I need a phone. Um, however, however exciting the, the latest technology might be. Um, but to choose the one I want, I could just go and, and look in a window and sort of peer at the phone and, and look around it and it looks like a phone or I, I could go out to lunch with an awesome sales rep who never actually shows me the phone, but talks it up and tells me it's really good. Um, I could just read articles online or I could actually go out and try one and see how it works for me. Um, and, and I think it's, it's, it sounds silly in the context of a phone. I don't think, um, well, we've got um, Vodafone over here. They've ever taken anyone out for lunch to sell them a phone, but, but it's pretty common as you get into, into bigger software areas. Um, I could talk to a friend who has a smartphone, but you know, they actually say they're really terrible um, and smartphones are a waste of time. But when I actually ask them a few more questions, it turns out they're using one that came out 10 years ago, the battery lasts five minutes and it's not actually compatible with any current cell phone networks. So it's um, their, their opinion on smartphones probably isn't, isn't the best option. So all I really want to say here is the best thing to do to figure out what you need is to make sure you, you're you going back to the data you've gathered, to the decisions, make sure it aligns with what you want, and then go out and try it. Um, and if possible, make a call and send an email from it. Cheers. So, yeah, thanks. And to, to sum that up, I guess, and to kind of five, oh, sorry, four, four points. I should know my own slides better than that. Don't get distracted. You've decided what you need. So just stick with it now. And assess and test. So keep your environments and use cases as close to real life as possible. And remember that no one knows your firm like you. So partnership is really important, but remember your needs and keep them front of mind. And a good flexible strategy I should add in there can hopefully prevent budget surprises. Awesome. Thanks. Thanks, Matt. Um, that was excellent. I think the point I liked the best um, and I swear by is make sure you get a demo and if possible, get a demo in your environment, which is probably more yeah. like a pilot rather than the sanitized, hygienic, perfect world demo where everything's um, built yeah. to sort of fit the sales narrative. Yeah. Awesome. All right. Thanks, Matt. Um, now we are on to the final part of our talk. Um, We've built our digital strategy in so far as we know what we want to do. We know the technology maybe that we're interested in, um, maybe a provider that's going to help us. But now we get to what I think is uh, the critical piece, although I'm a bit biased because I'm very passionate about this area. Um, the critical piece about how we get our people um, in for this journey, in for our digital strategy journey. Because the reason... I think this is so critical is that the success of a digital strategy, it's not judged by how good the technology is. It's judged by how well our people use that technology. So it's absolutely fundamental. But the challenge uh, that we have with change is that, you know, humans have a natural resistance to change and a preference for the status quo. And I think lawyers cop a double whammy in this regard because our training predisposes us to look out for the precedent cases and the rule of law. Like who remembers starry decisis at uni? That's sort of one of the Latin things I, I remember, like looking for the precedent. Um, it's sort of doubled down with sort of our, you know, pessimistic perfectionist training that we won't do anything unless we know all of the scenarios and everything's planned to a T. And then I think there's even probably a triple whammy here when we're talking about um, 
digital or technology change because I just think um, people still, even though we're in a technological century, people still have an enormous amount of suspicion about technology. Um, and I think there is a natural reluctance to adopt new technology. So what I wanted to cover today in sort of the remaining sort of 15 minutes before we get to um, some of the questions is five principles that I think um, uh, will help us if we keep them in mind when we're managing change with your digital strategy for your legal team so that we can make sure that the very important um, tips that Denise and Matt have talked us through come off. Um, so the first principle is explaining what's in it for me, what's in it for my team, what's in it for my company. And this is really, um, you know, going back to basics, if you think about days of debating or, you know, when you're negotiating with your five-year-old, you've got to set out, what, why is this person going to embrace this change? You've really got to sit down and get inside of their head almost and think about the benefits to them because strategy can promise a lot both in terms of you know like great vision um, amazing outcomes but there is that hump to get started there is it does come at a cost people often need to commit to time commit to the change so it's very important that we're up front when we're talking with our team about this and then balance balance it out with uh, the things that are going to be the benefits both to the individuals of the team so that hopefully you're having a fair and balanced conversation and at the end of that conversation you can tip the ledger in favour of let's move ahead with the change. When I think about a digital strategy some of the benefits that come to mind might be saves it saves me time I'm the lawyer it saves me time so an automation tool can save me from you know forwarding that email constantly or having to having trouble finding a document that I use all the time uh, it could help me focus my time then on more strategic work so I stop doing the low value rats and mice and I can really spend the time sinking my teeth into really important business projects which I love to do but I just never get to and if I try and wait till the end of the day I'm exhausted and they just don't ever happen. Um, another benefit could be um, that it helps the business generally um, with sort of timelines and expediency because they're not waiting on an individual. So I know that that job's not relying on me if it's a process that's automated or in a technology application, users can access it 24 seven. It's not stuck in my inbox or waiting for me to return a call. So it takes it out of my to-do list and it just makes it happen. Um, another benefit could be that it helps manage the risk for um, the legal team, for the company, because maybe your solution might be to keep a record of advice so you can apply that advice consistently. It logs contracts or contract obligations or where things have been approved. And maybe a benefit might be that it saves money. Um, I think here probably a call back to sort of the points that Denise made that, um, you know, there could be um, a point that you make as well about the benefits of aligning the digital, uh, of the, the benefits of alignment where a digital strategy can bring your team into alignment, possibly with the corporate strategies or corporate values. And that can be also quite important. And I know for uh, myself at Origin with the legal team, part of the transformation plan that I worked on and some of the systems that we implemented, they were really to bring us up to speed with other business units that were had a way of working that was much more um, efficient and centralised and to sort of align us with them. But then the flip side of that, what are some of the cons? Let's be um, upfront about them. So cons that might emerge from a digital strategy that I think we should be honest about is there is that initial sort of upfront time for training, time to understand technology, and the pressure maybe to get it right for lawyers um, and the time that it's going to take them away from their ordinary work. Don't underestimate that and think about how you're going to resource that because, you know, people are still going to be expecting them to do their day jobs. Another, um, another con might be, you know, the financial cost of a solution and also that not just the cost of the license cost, but the cost of implementation. And then the final con could be ownership, like working out who is going to own this digital strategy or this solution going forward and what's the time that they're going to dedicate to making sure that they own it, that they maintain it properly. 
Um, Denise, I think you had an example that I've asked you to share about, um, you know, the benefits to um, the team, to the company that you had working with Telstra and its triage system. Would you mind sharing that with us? Certainly. Um, as I said, when I was talking about the, the steps to the digital strategy and implementing a new system, the way that the lawyers worked was very much around the clients would either ring or email or um, have a meeting, book a meeting with the lawyer to get the matter. And we were moving to an online system. And we talked with the lawyers before they went out to their clients about, you know, the benefits that we were going to get from this. Um, we focused a little bit too much probably on what was in it for the lawyers. So when the team went and started to brief their business clients, the business clients were like, whoa, this is like more work for us. Um, and they were very much about, well, this isn't going to work and, and very negative about the change. And so a couple of the lawyers who experienced that came back to me and said, oh, this isn't going to work. And I said, well, why is that? Because the business has realized that it's going to be more work for them. And I'm like, okay, well, share a bit about how you uh, explained it to them. And I and they talked me through what they said. And I said, well, how about if we reframe it? And instead of you focusing the conversation on how it's going to benefit legal, you focus the conversation on how it's going to benefit the business mm -hmm. and the data that we're going to get and the ability for them to see where their matter is and all of the new things that they're going to get as opposed to sitting in front of you and, and explaining what their matter is. And they went, oh, yeah, OK, that makes complete sense. They did go out and we we, we didn't get, uh, I'm going to say, 100 percent embracing the change. But we did get a much higher level because we went back out and, and clarified what the benefits were going to be for the for the business. Yeah, thanks, Denise. And I, I mean, I think that um, drives home the point that, you know, you shouldn't take a one size fits all as well to selling your digital strategy. You really do need to be nuanced in who you're talking to, be it the team, be it clients, be it, um, you know, the, your C-suite, be it someone external. And so to really um, think about that and plan for it, because it can make or break the, the success in the change management piece. Um, the second pillar or second principle that I was going to focus on is around planning. So my motto is plan and plan some more. Um, this is my favourite uh, area. I get carried away in terms of planning, but I just don't think you can underestimate the value of planning when it comes to landing a digital strategy. Um, it takes a lot of time and love. Um, legal teams do come in all shapes and sizes. And I think um, one of the biggest challenges is working out how to carve out time for a digital strategy. Um, don't just ask a lawyer to do it at the end of the day. Some teams such as my own and maybe Denise's are lucky enough to have people that are dedicated in the role. So I um, stepped into this role from being a lawyer three days a week and this is what I do. But I know uh, Origin Legal's got about 25 lawyers, which makes us sort of a, a larger team in the, the, the market in Australia and New Zealand. If you don't have that set up, think about how you can protect and insulate whoever's going to manage this and their time so that it is dedicated, be it a day a week or three hours a week. Uh, it's very important though, to prioritize the time. Then in terms of the planning that they do, um, at a strategic level, I think a few things to think about are, you know, how does um, the digital strategy align with other enterprise digital strategies. So a lot of times um, they will dovetail into other projects. So for me, um, the contract automation um, piece that I just spoke about previously dovetailed nicely into an origin um, enterprise finance system changeover where we're changing our finance systems and the new finance system has triggered an opportunity to sort of revisit our award to pay and therefore contract governance system. So it's been a great opportunity and being at a strategic, um, uh, being strategically engaged and knowing about that project has allowed me to sort of plan um, the piece around contract automation with the appropriate people at Origin so that they sort of sync up and they're part of the bigger picture. Likewise, um, the, at an enterprise level, we're redesigning our intranet page and there's been a bit of a push internally for sort of self-help, self, self self-service tools. So I'm like, fabulous. I know just how we're going to sort of design and launch these when we launch our new intranet page. 
At an operational level though, I think planning, um, there's a few things I would take out of it. Firstly, think about maybe the tools you use. Um, there's lots of great um, task trackers, lots of Kanban boards and Jira's. Um, Matt re referred to sort of the Microsoft um, um, 0365 suite. They've got a number of tools for that. There's just no shortage. But what I would say, no matter what um, platform you use is, don't underestimate the value of tracking the activities as part of your strategy and reporting back to build momentum. One thing that I've introduced with the Origin um, broader sort of legal team, even though I feel like I'm saying the same thing every month, what it does I think is it builds confidence in the, the, the strategy that we're rolling out, that it's on track that people are delivering, that people are doing stuff, that there's projects. And I think it also helps with the leadership team flag any issues early so there's no surprises. It's very, very powerful to sort of track that um, activity. Another thing at an operational level from a planning perspective with a digital strategy to think about is your governance model. So who are your key stakeholders and what decisions do you need them to make? Uh, it will depend on the size, um, of the strategy piece and what sort of areas it's going to impact. But I think it's really important to have that conversation up front and be really clear about who is deciding what. And then the final sort of operational um, planning piece is about planning the comm strategy and the cadence for that. Who needs to know what? When do they need to know it? What's the best way to cut through? Is it an email every week? Is it a um, using a Teams page? Is it on a you know workplace? Think about that because it can again be very um, important to get to land that right from a, a planning perspective to get the change piece in place. Um, the third principle that I think is important is to identify your change champions and your resistors. Um, dealing with people and people's love of technology and digital, um, people, people's love of technology does vary widely. Some of us are happy to jump in. So if, if I hear about a new technology or if I'm stuck using an app, I will just jump on, um, you know, Google or whatever search engine I use and just there's always videos or demos and I'm happy to kind of teach myself, but some people paralyzed by that. So you've got to work out the people that your, um, your digital strategy applies to that are affected by it. Where do they sit on the spectrum and what sort of conversations do you have with those different people? It's very important, I think, to think about how you harness your change champions to your benefit. Do you buddy them up with people that are less um, inclined to use um, technology or digital pieces? Do you help them um, get to run the demos, do a Q&A or test the platform? But they're quite valuable assets to you. And so you should think about how you mobilize them as part of your change management piece. And with the resistors, I think, uh, it's very clear that um, up front, make it clear what the ramifications are if they don't get with the program. Um, most people, I think, um, that, or, you know, are resistors, they're not actively hostile. It's just that they will tend to nod along in a meeting and then they'll just go back to their old habits. Um, for this cohort, some um, options that you might like to consider, consider as part of sort of the broader um, technology changes maybe you know can you offer them a special sort of concierge service where you get half an hour with someone who really knows the solution to kind of set them up right on their desktop and just gives them the confidence that they're in the right place can you um, maybe um, you know check check their setup on their screen um, can you help them with their time management so just book in a check-in you know once a week just to make sure that they're on track um, and then also sort of around champions and resistors really make the leaders in your team or your business your champions um, and, you know, make sure that they have overcome their bias, make sure that um, they are, you know, walking the talk when it comes to the change in the digital strategy that you're pushing to implement. Um, Matt, you've got a great example about using change champions. Can you share that with us briefly? Yeah, yeah. You just, um, your comment on managing their bias um, reminds me of an experience where the change champion was clearly unenthusiastic about the product. <laughs> and it was, it was so hard um, to sort of to sit through their presentation on it when they clearly had no actual, yeah. actual engagement in it at all. But yeah, I guess I've got kind of um, an example. We, we, there were, we had a, um, a system we wanted 
to update. Um, and it was mainly driven by us. Uh, the license period was coming to an end. There was a better product out there. It was, it was slightly more cost effective but, effective, but offered a lot more. So we decided we were going to make the transition. And, and it, it went okay, it was, it was a bit rushed, but it was very much driven from a, a sort of team, a practice management kind of um, IT area rather than an actual sort of desire for it in, in the firm. And, and we, we probably could have, we definitely could have done a lot better with our change management there. But I had an example recently where someone came to me and asked for something. Mm -hmm. um, that was going to improve the experience of um, the in court experience for our lawyers and and it's just amazing the difference when it's being driven by someone who's fairly senior in a team they're really engaged and and they see the demand essentially we're helping them deliver a solution you know and and they can sell it to their team we can we can sort of get the, the sort of the boring stuff done because they're enthusiastic about it and um and the change just sort of flows really naturally. And it's not always possible with anything, but if you can kind of sow the seeds of a change early on and try and get it to feel more organic, it can really pay dividends. Um, and that also gives you a lot of credibility when it comes to the changes that aren't so organic and are actually, they just have to happen. Yeah. Um, people will then sort of take your word for it and, and those changes become easier as well. Yeah. yeah, that's great. Sort of building up the trust and the relationship mm. element too. Absolutely. Yeah. Thanks, Matt. Great. Well, the fourth principle that I want to touch on is around um, support. So supporting people through a, a change, a digital strategy change. I think uh, one of my biggest learnings in this space is that um, the, the importance and the power of giving support to people at all stages of the change. Um, I used to think that it was just about, you know, developing one slide pack saying, this is the strategy. Here it is, tie it up with a bow, tick, it's done. Put it in the bottom of the drawer. No, definitely not. Not the case. I think great change management is all about um, the support the communications that you bring to the people that are impacted by it both before the change, during it and after. And I think that's got, it's got a massive role in overcoming that human resistance, um, providing people with assurance along the way, reminding them that it may not be perfect, but look, I'm going to be here holding your hand the whole way. This is all the support pieces I've got in place for you. Um, I think an example that I've got when I worked on the a legal matter management document management implementation was before the implementation we gave training, we put out, we put time aside. So with the lawyers, we empowered them to block out the day. We told the business we were migrating to new systems. We prepared a raft of guidance notes. Once we turned on the system, we did a daily check-in every day for two weeks. There was a half hour sort of doctor is in. If anyone wanted to dial in, they could and ask an expert a question. We had floor walkers, like people physically there back in the days when we were in the office to help people like configure their desktops. And we had an ongoing helpline that we sort of logged the questions. And then after, so it wasn't just at that time, but then after what we did was sort of quarterly health checks, checking in, making sure that people were knowing how to use the system updating our own guidance notes if they'd changed and then training lawyers where we identified that there were gaps in their knowledge to say we're still here we're still listening the final principle that I think is really important for change management is about embedding the change because uh, it's not always going to be change uh, hopefully where you get to with a digital strategy is that becomes the way of working so how do you move from something that will be to something that is I think a few observations that I've made along the way and and and, and I, I wouldn't underestimate the challenge of embedding the change I think this probably really is one of the most challenging aspects of change management but a few observations that I make I would make would be Celebrate the wins, the anniversaries, the successes. Um, help people see how far you've come. So don't forget to, to remind them, this is what we did six months ago. This is how much time we used to do and now we don't have to worry about that. So my example is we used to do, um, we used to open legal matters on Excel spreadsheets where lawyers keyed it in and then the our admin systems had to double key it into our billing system and then it came back and there were three or four emails and it was an absolute 
you know, it, it's, it took a lot of administrative time. That doesn't happen anymore. And I just need to keep reminding people we have this great system that saves us this time. I think another thing that helps in this way is to find owners. So making people accountable. So being clear about who owns what and who does what when you're thinking about your planning stage and you're thinking about um, the pieces of maintenance, who reviews the guidance notes, who updates the training and put people's roles or names next to it. But rather than just saying we should, we should, we should, I think it really makes a difference when you start, um, you know, getting people um, involved and named in part of the project. I think it's very important to continue, continue regular reviews, checking in on your digital strategy as often as you can, but at least quarterly, if not six monthly. And I think getting feedback um, from people um, about, you know, if you're making a, a tactical change or an operational change in your digital strategy, and that's come from someone's suggestion, and it's a great one, call that person out in a meeting say I had a conversation with Bob Bob um, pointed me to this that was going on which I wasn't aware of but I've looked into it it was a great idea and as a result we're pivoting our strategy in this way thanks Bob call them out in front of the team because you want to in, encourage and embed that kind of behavior where people are owning the owning the the strategy and are coming to you know that central person with those ideas and feedback because it just really builds that um, you know um, embedding that change within your team and then I think just to pick up on the point of the leaders is to just get your your leaders into the habit of using, showing, telling, walking the talk. So if I pick up the example that we've been using about the smartphone, what I would be asking if as a sort of a change management piece would be, well, what's in it for me? Like, you know, a new phone's got a better camera, better battery life, but on the con, it's going to cost me a lot of money and I'm going to have to go through all that tedious thing where I work out if all of my phones have been backed up, all of my pictures have been backed up on the cloud or not, and am I going to lose contacts in the day or two when I don't have a phone, how am I going to cope? Um, my planning piece would be around, well, my current contract expires in two weeks time. So that's probably a good time to switch over because I won't be breaking a contract. But I also recognise as part of my planning that I need someone to help me because I'm no good at all of that phone techie stuff. So I might make some time in my calendar to just spend an hour on the phone with, you know, Optus or Telstra or whoever it is. Um, and also I want to make sure I get a good price. So I'm going to make a note the week before to jump online and have a look at some of the pricing plans to make sure I'm getting the best deal. I also want to know where do I go if I get stuck? Have I got friends that are helpful? Is my husband any good? Uh, have I got the help number for, you know, my provider? And then the last thing is, what are the new features that I need to stay on top of? Have I got a friend that I'm going to go to? Am I going to maybe subscribe to an email or something that might tell me what the new, you know, iOS platform releases are going to do to my phone when they come out, just so I know I get into the habit of learning them and making the most from my phone. Um, so I'm going to summarise my section quickly. I've got one slide just to put up. So the five principles that I talked about were um, explaining what's in it for me, my team, my company, uh, to plan and plan some more, um, identify the change champions and resistors, to get support, have a plan for support and to embed the change. All right, we're right on time. Um, I've asked each of our speakers just to um, share with the audience one takeaway. We're going to take 30 seconds and then we're going to move to some of the questions that we've got. So, Denise, let's start with you. What's your one takeaway that you want to make for today's session for our listeners? I think one key takeaway is to understand that digital strategies are extremely useful to help teams achieve their goals. Um, they aren't set forever, though. They're three to five year plans. And they, you know, if you continue on continuous improvement, uh, you can pivot. So if I think about an example, when we did the um, our priorities, everyone would have said contract review is our number one priority. But after we actually did that exercise, it wound up being resource capacity. Matt. Yeah, I think for me, uh, it's when you've developed your strategy, just keep it front of mind. And and there's a variety of ways to do that, but always be referring back to it. Whenever you're talking about um, IT in your firm, refer back to your strategy and even how it refers to your company's um, wider strategy and values, because it's, it's so easy for these things to kind of age off, especially in a 
in a smaller environment where it might only be one or two people who are kind of focused in that area. So um, align your your planning for the month, for the year, and for the for the duration of the strategy. Make sure it's that always calls back um, so people know what's out there. Great. And I think my takeaway is um, to be prepared to spend as much time and potentially money um, on the change management piece and the design and implementation of a digital strategy as the digital technology itself. I think everyone loves the idea of a digital strategy, but you've got to take care when you're implementing it because of the human biases against change. All right, now we've got some questions. Um, I'm going to take them in order and I'll share them with Matt and Denise as we go. Hi, Tracy, you asked a question right up front about using Slack and Microsoft Teams. I'll defer to my colleagues on Slack, but in terms of Microsoft Teams, my observation would be a broader one about um, something that I think Matt touched on around the sort of enterprise solution. So I use Microsoft Teams. Um, Origin has 0365 uh, license for employees so using teams is um, you know become quite a part of our day-to-day -day jobs all of my meetings are through teams um, a lot of the documents now that I share with the business are on teams so I think my observation would be that um, where they're available I think particularly for in-house teams they will if they're not already facing this they will find that there's a big push um, to say you're not getting any other solutions or applications or don't put anything else in your digital strategy that something in our enterprise suite can already do. So for me, I use Teams and I'm not looking at any alternatives because it's kind of embedded in the origin um, fabric. Um, Slack, I'm, I, I've heard of it, but I, I haven't got any experience with it. I don't know if Denise or Matt would like to comment on it. Not specifically, but I guess the concept of a, a, a chat, a instant messaging platform across the business is, is, is invaluable. One really good thing to think about when you're looking, evaluating whether or not it is the right fit, and it, and it will be, I think, but uh, as part of that change piece is to help the business define what types of communication fit on which platform. Some things are still best as email. Teams can definitely replace a lot of those kind of reply all back and forths, you know, who wants to go for lunch kind of things, um, as well as collaborating when you're physically separated. But it is really good to, to help people understand the different platforms because it's easy to introduce, introduce a new way of communicating, but not really talk about why, why you have it outside of explaining its capabilities. Great, thank you. Uh, I've got a question from Helen. Hello, Helen. Um, it's probably a question for Denise. Helen's asked, any tips to avoid death by data? If you measure everything, how do you figure out what's useful? Um, what a great question. Yes, death by data. You don't want to, um, you don't want reams and reams of data, but I think it's, it's important to differentiate between data capture and measurement. Um, you don't necessarily have to measure everything that you capture, capture data, um, but not necessarily, you, after a period of time go, I'm not gonna use this data, so I, I'm gonna stop capturing it because it's not anything that I need to, to, to use now, but I can use in the future. And I think one of the important things of, to, to make sure that you're not um, doing that is to prioritize. So once you have your clear priorities um, and you have your clear requirements from a data digital strategy, for example, that will then inform what are the things that you want to measure, which will then inform how you want to capture the data that you want to capture to measure that. So I would say um, focus on priorities, and then that should should um, that should en enable the discussion around. What are we going to measure and make sure that we're, me we're capturing what we're going to measure? I hope that answers your question, Helen. I think it starts at least. Um, all right, next question from Matt uh, from Ramu. When it comes to IT vendors, they keep coming up with new things for us to try when we decide a project as simple as upgrading network cables. How do we keep check on the scope and keep vendors sticking to the scope? Mm. I, I, that's a really good question. And, and it's, it's something that I'm definitely, you know, feel like I'm, I'm battling a lot, you know, in, in my role is sort of keeping that. Maybe a school the, teacher. Yeah, you, you do have to be a bit. Um, 
having a strategy, <laughs> you know, um, you're in the right place. But if you've got a plan um, that you can, even if it's a pretty high level thing, you know, but um, it will help you understand, you know, okay, so we do need to replace all our network cables, but actually we're probably going to be moving, or I don't know, moving offices or um, in three years, we think we'll be working remotely or um, in a more IT specific space, you know, we might be just able to use Wi-Fi. So we actually, we will replace the cables now, but we know we don't need to do anything else because we've planned something in a couple of years that's going to change that. So that that's one, one really key thing. But I know it is really challenging, especially if you're engaging a IT vendor as someone who's not, um, you know, dedicated to IT in your role. Um, people can be quite um, good at, you know, using some fairly manipulative tactics to, to get you to, to do more. But I think basically sometimes you also, I have just had to say to vendors, you know, we're, we're really happy with the service you provide us and that's all, you know, we don't, we don't need anything else. Yeah. yeah. Great. I've got one question. I'm going to be sneaky and squeeze it in because I think um, we probably all have a view on it. How extensive is the practice of developing your own mm. tech using internal tech folks for legal tech for in-house legal departments versus buying it from external vendors who customise? Um, it happens. Um, my experience is, though, um, you just want to get the experts to do what they're good at and stick you know you stick to what you're good at I think it can be quite dangerous if you try and build something and yeah. it's the first time um, you don't want to be the guinea pig unless you know you've got a little playpen and that's what you've announced mm -hmm. that you're doing if you've got a specific strategy I think it's probably quite risky to try and build it yourself because even though you think you might be saving costs probably your time is the cost um, As... think, Matt you probably got a, a similar view but yeah, there's a little um, um, phrase that I use in this context, and it's it's bend before you buy, before you build, you know. So if you can make an existing system work, go for it, you know. Yeah. If you can't, and there's a system out there that's going to do the job for you, buy it. Yeah. If there's nothing there, then you can look at, then it's worth looking at building it. But if you go, and, and that basically is an order of cost, and it's, very hard, very hard to build something yourself that will cost less than, than a system that's out there. I like that. Bend, buy, build. I do generally steal that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's, it's not original. Like, I can't claim Copyright, it either. But, trademark, yeah. Yeah, yeah, but I do. Um, I, I always have that in the back of my mind in, in that context, yeah. That's a very good point. I think from, from my experience, I'm exactly the same. Um, you want to leave things to the experts. We did test a couple of building some legal tech within Telstra um, and a couple of, I guess, the challenges that we had were that if it's not their priority, it's not, um, it's not, if, if you're not there in their priorities, it's not going to get done and it's going to, it takes a really long time to get things done. Um, and in some cases, it's not always cheaper to build it. It's, uh, you know, there's a lot of good technology out there today that, yeah. Um, you know, software as a service is, is not as expensive as it as technologies used to be 10, 15 years ago. So you really need to do your, your homework to understand if I'm going to build it in-house, is it going to be cheaper? Yeah. Terrific. Well, we're right on time. I'd like to thank Denise and Matt so much for joining me. Uh, remind everybody that this is on demand if you want to go and watch it again and take more notes and also that you can follow the work of the CLI and Alpla um, on LinkedIn, Facebook and Twitter. Um, I'm very happy if people want to reach out to me on LinkedIn. I'm sure Matt and Denise are. So thank Absolutely. you. Have a great evening. Thanks, guys. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks, Katrina. Thanks, Matt. Thanks, everyone. Thank Thanks. you. Thanks, team. Bye.